one. Welcome to the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers of Washington and its monthly author showcase. I am your host, Peter Stockwell. First elf on this third Christmas show of The Claw on Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. And I think I hear Santa Claus. Father Christmas, you know, St. Nick, that person who has all the goodies and the ho, presents. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. And he comes ho, down ho, the ho. chimney. Ho, ho, ho. And it looks like he eats ding dong. Ho, ho, ho. And Twinkies. And Rudolph, you too. Awesome. Back it up. No, I don't have to. Go ahead. Getting them all wordy again, I see. No. That's fine. Santa Claus. That's me. Getting all wordy again, I see. That's fine. Santa Claus is good enough. And I'm his partner in crime, Mark Miller. Which, additional, with additional help from the first reindeer that anybody knows as Rudolph the Reindeer. Still needs to cut down on all the cookies and stuff. The reindeer are getting tired. They're hauling your fat behind the ground. At least this year, there's no Bremerton windstorm. Hey, it's an addiction. Christmas cookies and hot chocolate. They got drugs in them. In, in candy canes. Uh, this is Claw at BAKT's third annual Christmas show. Mark and I have been involved in this production for over three years now. So we thought it was time for another fun show for this particular day, Christmas, with all its cultural, religious, and social connections. You okay there, Ren Rudolph? Mm. Yeah, I know, I know. Those Twinkies and Ding Dongs. Right. Ding Dongs, Ding -dongs get Twinkies, mm, better than cookies. Anyway, to talk about this day, Christmas, with all its cultural, religious, and social connections, this is an especially needed during this time of our COVID sickness. And we do have, hope you have some of the more uplifting excerpts from the works of our authors and our artists. We have readings of some of the works provided by past victims of our interviews. <laughs> this readings will help to celebrate a Christmas spirit and to create a Christmas spirit of joy and companionship with friends and family with social distancing, of course. Yes, but no matter what your spiritual beliefs are now, Christmas has become a time of brother and sisterhood, of spending time with family and loved ones. And of reindeer and elves all getting double overtime for all the extra hours we put in so we could all get presents for our loved ones. Our first author will be J.W. Capek, with a story about that she's written about her Christmas cheer. Holiday Bits and Pieces by J.W. Capek, December 2020. Matthew laughed to himself as he decoded the SOS being tapped on his wall. Philip's jokes are even funnier in person, but the residents, associated care apartments, were in lockdown due to the COVID-19 virus. The two old gentlemen would thwart the isolation by tapping out their messages. What are you doing for the holidays? Dot, dash, dash, dot, dot. Oh, same as you. Dot, dot, dot. Evening dinner on our tray in our own apartment. Dash, dot, dot, dash. Family? Probably not. Same here. Even if they came with their masks on, they would probably be denied. Good excuse for them not to bother. Yeah, same here. Both widowers of long standing, veterans from another war, Matthew and Philip met for long treks with their walkers in the residence gardens. In inclement weather, they gravitated to the game room and jigsaw puzzles displayed on the tables. Visits in each apartment, long discussions in the hallway, and shared dinner hours cemented the friendship. 
with the current lockdown, they rediscovered the Morse code and both preferred it to the computers and smartphones in their apartment cubbies. Matthew wanted to tap out a sigh, but instead just went to the window to watch the autumn rain. The reoccurring isolation of the past year was exacerbated by the coming holidays. It had been different when his wife, Helen, was alive. Family get-togethers were anticipated and enjoyed. After her death, the kids drifted into their own families and activities with in-laws. Matthew was always invited, but it was bittersweet without Helen. Since he moved to the residence, holidays changed, depending on the efforts of the staff and the camaraderie of the residents. Looking out to the garden below, Matthew watched a bird relishing the rain as it fluttered its wings. It reminded him of an old song about dancing in the rain. That did it. He was tired of moaning about the past. He straightened with new resolve. He was going to change this holiday season into something special. A ring at his door let him know his favorite caregiver, Maria, had left his dinner tray outside the door. He was able to open it before Maria reached Philip's door. Maria, will you be working the holidays, he called after her. Oh, yes, she smiled beneath her mask. Overtime, plus I get to be with my favorite residents. I uh, might need your help getting something special going. Okie dokie she agreed, as she continued down the hall with her cart of dinners. Now Matthew was committed to come up with a plan of his own. It would take a few days, but as he lay awake one morning, it came to him. It would be novel, it would include the family, and it would be fun. He began an extensive survey of all the photos and images he had on hand. His computer had a collection of slides his son had given to him, there were new pictures from old friends in their holiday cards, even pictures he had learned to take on the smartphone when he wasn't angry at it for its constant updates. He slipped old photos to Maria as she picked up the trays and she scanned and emailed them back to him. Going through the files and JPEGs, Matthew enjoyed memories and created a collage of family photos. Finally pleased with a completed image and advice from Philip, the file was ordered through a puzzle printer uh, on the internet. When it arrived, it was a box with a photo on top and a thousand puzzle pieces jumbled together in a plastic sack. Oh, what do I do now, he wondered with a laugh. Working through the night, pawing through the cut pieces, Matthew saw the family he loved. Carefully, he divided the finished puzzle into four quadrants with the corners and colors in place. He paused at one face, thinking of Helen. Puzzles had always been an evening pleasure for them. She was a stickler for isolating all the straight edge pieces and establishing a frame, while Matthew just sorted everything into colors, straight edges or not. Their children started with nursery puzzles at the play table, and it was a rite of passage to join their parents at the big puzzle. After sorting each quarter of the puzzle into its own pile, Matthew printed cards showing the original collage picture. He dropped the pieces into four separate mailers with a card addressed to each family. No directions were included or explanation of why they received only a part of the puzzle. The holiday morning, Matthew was disappointed. No one had called or even acknowledged the receipt of the puzzle pieces. Philip was preoccupied with a teleconference with his own family. By late afternoon, Matthew was feeling extremely disappointed and he had to admit, lonely. When the phone startled him, Matthew was surprised to hear Maria speaking. Mr. Matthew, please come down to the garden room. Why well, come down to an empty room, he said a bit grumpy. Matthew, I asked politely, now please. Maria was direct. 
Matthew negotiated the hall to the elevator, and being the only person there, he followed the residence rules and went downstairs to the garden room. As he started to shuffle into the room, he stopped short. The bay window was filled on the outside with all four of his children and their families. They were wearing holiday masks and regalia and carrying signs wishing him a happy holiday. A portable tent had been erected so they could distance yet be together under cover. Kisses from masked faces flew through the glass and eyes transmitted smiles. Hands touched with only glass separating them. They hugged their own families and held open arms to him. Matthew could hear the notes of carols piped into the room and it was joined by the voices of, through the glass. And then Matthew saw the thousand piece puzzle on his side of the window glass. In front of the window on a large table the entire puzzle had been assembled. Mixed and matched pieces jigsawed together to show the collage of Matthew's family portrait. His children had combined the assembled fragments together, just as they had assembled their busy lives to be at the residence this day. Handing their completed sections over to Maria earlier in the day, the staff had finished the puzzle for Matthew. But in its entirety, it showed one piece was missing in the center. Matthew's throat was too choked to express words, but long-held tears glimmered as he looked at the families through the glass. He pulled the tiny cardboard piece out of his pocket, gently touched its edges, and placed it in the puzzle. It was the piece with Helen's face on it, and he had kept it for himself. Now it was where it belonged, in the family puzzle. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, JW. That was very nice. Next we have... Anybody you want. Who? Oh, the story of the Who. I will be reading the story of the Who and the Grinch who stole Christmas. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And there hanging their stockings, he snarled it with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with grinchy fingers, nervously drumming. I must find a way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow he knew all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early, they'd rush for their toys. And then, oh the noise, oh the noise, 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 noise. One thing he hated, the noise, 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 noise. Then the Who's young and old would sit down to a feast and they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. They would feast on who pudding and rare who roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, 
would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the Who's would start singing. They'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of who this Who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop the whole thing. Why, for 53 years, I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat, and he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked. What a great Grinchy trick. With his coat and his hat, I'll look just like St. Nick. All I need is reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But since reindeer are scarce, there were none to be found. That did, did that stop old Grinch? No, the Grinch simply said, if I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max. Then he had some red thread. And he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some empty old sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, Giddy up! And the sled started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were dreaming sweet dreams without care. When he came to the first little house on the square, this is number one stop, the old Grinch Claus hissed, and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santy could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once, for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out, the fireplace flew. Where the little who stockings all hung in a row, these stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant. A whole room, and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates and drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn and plums. And he stuffed them in bags, then the cringe very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Then he slunk to the icebox, he took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding, he took the roast beast. He cleaned out that icebox as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their very last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now, grinned the Grinch, I'll stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to shove when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned round fast and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who had gotten out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick. He thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Why, my little sweet tot, the fake Santa Claus lied. There's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child, then he patted her head. He got her a drink, and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went up the chimney and stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other who houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other who mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still abed. 
all the who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled. Packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo to the who's was Grinchlishly humming. They're finding that out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hold open a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will all cry boo hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused. And the Grinch put a hand to his ear. And did he hear a sound rising over the snow? It started in low, and then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook what he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who in down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without presents, any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without packages, boxes, or tags. It came without ribbons. It came without bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, his whi he whizzed his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. That was, wasn't that a good read? I just love that. Excellent. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Next. We have Rudolph. She has a story about Christmas love and care. And this is a special little book that I thought was very appropriate for reindeers and Santa and everybody to hear for Christmas. It's called A Dog's Night Before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas. A huge storm was brewing. Santa looked out to see what the weather was doing. It made him quite nervous, though twas Christmas Eve, to take out the reindeer. But he really must leave. He bid all farewell and went on his way, flying high in the sky, not a moment's delay. Approaching a city, he yelled, ho, 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 but the sleigh, his snowbank as it came in too low. Donner and Blitzen knew something was wrong. The sleigh would not move, and old St. Nick was gone. Comet then told them he saw Santa sink way under the snow, just as quick as a wink. Cupid, the bright one, said, we must get help from our friends in this town that bark, growl, and yelp. There is one dog who won't find this job to be too hard, the gentle and loving, but huge St. Bernard. They sent out the call through the network of hounds to please find a saint before morning came round. Shruti, the sharp pay, was licking bones clean when she got the message and passed it to Dean. Dean, a long Dachshund, was trying to think where he'd last seen Bojangles, perhaps at the shrink. Bojangles, the saint, was really cut quite frisky, but sometimes at Christmas he was known to get tipsy. Beatrice, the Basset, was seeing the bed. After trudging through snow, 
Her long ears were all wet. Yes, she had seen Bo, who was looking quite hardy, after playing with the kids at the school Christmas party. When Lenny the Lab heard the news about Bo, he was chasing Miss Fifi beneath the mistletoe. He rushed to the door and howled at the moon and knew if Bo heard him, he'd be there real soon. The howling of Lenny rang through the night till the sweet sounds of Christmas went right out of sight. Old English could hear him and the howled along too. And his pal, Irish Wolfhound, made quite a to-do. Very soon all the dogs, both the pets and the strays, were yelping and yapping in all different ways. The Cocker in Yorkshire and Spotted Dalmatian, together with Setters, set Bo's invitation to please return home in a very great haste. For Santa needs help and there is no time to waste. Well, Bo got the message and lumbered on home. His barrel was bouncing, his mouth ripped with foam. Then he burrowed his nose way deep in the snow and he pulled and he tugged on Santa's big toe. When Saint Nick popped out with a sigh of relief, the reindeer and dogs heard these words from their chief. My friends made the plea, and you did not fail them. May your new year be filled with fire hydrants and mailmen. Nice. A five ho 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 rating from Santa. Ho 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 rating? Never mind. Excellent work. Do you have anything to add, Peter? Well, I was going to ask our resident reindeer, do you have anything else to pass on for Christmas? I understand you have something about our military people. Well, and Santa Claus, you should tell everybody about our continuing adventures with the North American Defense Command, or NORAD. Ah, yes, nothing like dodging F-22s over Alaska. There we are, 40,000 feet, flat on our backs, no fooling, jigging and janking. Our IFF wasn't working, and I guess they thought I was a Russian bear bomber. I tell you, do I look like a bear? <laughs> you still look like a bear who's stuck for hibernation, and you're grumpy like that one sometimes. Everyone's a comedian. Yeah. Now I think that Rudolph had an additional read to do also. And this is called A Soldier's Silent Night Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas he lived all alone in a one bedroom house made of plaster and stone. I had come down the chimney with presents to give and to see just who in this dwelling did live. As I looked all around, a strange sight to see, no tinsel, no presents, not even a tree, no stockings on the mantel, just boots filled with sand. On the wall hung pictures far of a far distant land, medals and badges, awards of all kind, a sobering thought came alive in my mind, this house is different. It was dark, it was dreary. I had found the home of a soldier. I could see that most clearly. The soldier slept, lay sleeping, silent, alone, curled up on the floor in this one bedroom home. His face was so gentle. The room was in such disorder. Not at all how I picture a United States soldier. Was this the hero of whom I had just read, curled up on a poncho, a floor for a bed? Then I realized the other families that I saw this night owed their lives to soldiers who were willing to fight. In the morning round 
the world, children would play, grown-ups would celebrate a bright Christmas day. But they all enjoyed freedom every month of the year because of soldiers like the one lying here. I couldn't help wonder how many lay alone on a cold Christmas Eve in a land far from home. The very thought brought a tear to my eye. I dropped to my knees and I started to cry. The soldier awakened. I heard his rough voice. Santa, don't cry. This life is my choice. I fight for freedom. I don't ask for more. My life is my God, my country, my court. The soldier rolled over and drifted to sleep, but I couldn't control it. I continued to weep. I kept watch for hours so silent and still as both of us shivered from the cold night's chill. I didn't want to leave him on that cold, dark night this guardian of honor so willing to fight. Then the soldier rolled over and in a, a voice soft and pure, he whispered, carry on Santa, it's Christmas day, all is secure. One look at my watch and I knew he was right. Merry Christmas, my friend. May God bless you this night. Thank you. That was an excellent piece, very appropriate. Now, I believe Santa Claus has a bit of a twist on Twas the Night Before Christmas, and this extra particular literary item kind of fits in with today's workings of the virus that is uh, plaguing us worldwide. Do it. Twas the Night Before Christmas, but all through the house, not a creature was leaving, not even a mouse. All the corona masks were hung by the chimney and doors with care, in the hopes the health police would be understanding and fair. The children were all hiding in their beds, with visions of remote learning frying their heads, with Mona in her gas mask and I in my full body hazmat. We all settled down for a cold winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I fell from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the tape-sealed window I stumbled like an ass, tripped and fell, smack face first into the glass. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave an appearance of midday to objects below. When what to my watering eyes did appear, but a SWAT van and eight large armed people in tactical gear. The driver was a person who not lively nor quick, but I knew from TV must be Inslee, Mr. Slick. More rapid than eagles, his enforcers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dow, now Durkin, now Lancer and Dixon, on Charlie, on Stupid, on Donnie and Ferguson. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, clash away, flash, bang away all. As leaves up before the wind's wild storm do fly, when they met with an obstacle, climb in the sky. So up on the house, the squatters they flew, with tactical bags full of assault weapons too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof, the smashing and stomping of each black boot. But I covered my head and was turning around, crashing down to the ceiling, Slick Inslee came with a bound. He was dressed all in black from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of masks he had flung on his back, and he looked like a bully just ready to smack. His eyes, how they crinkled, his breath smelled of sherry, his cheeks were all sunken, his nose like a raspberry. His salivating mouth was drawn up like a ghoul, and the M95 mask was soaked from his drool. The mask he held tight in his teeth, and his exhales came out ever so weak. He had a flushed face and a big round belly that shook when he gasped, all soft and smelly. He was smuggling, he was stumbling and stumpy, looked a bit like Alf, and he sneered when he saw me, and I nearly wet myself. 
poke in my eye, a smack on my head, soon gave me to know I had much to dread. He spoke some words and went straight to his work, and his jackbooted thugs threatened my family like jerks. You are not social distancing, you dare to eat out, yelled Inslee. You went to a restaurant, and now a fine we must give ye. He yelled at his team, who gave him some thick rolled papers. He used them to beat my nose as if I was a puppy. The team tore up all of the presents looking for COVID. Screamed when all they found was a book for my son David. With angry cries and shouts, the SWAT team and Inslee leapt into the night. But I heard him bellow. Here they drove out of sight. No Christmas for you, you stupid little person. Now I'm off to my state mansion. Remember the science. As the governor's pack disappeared into the night, I thought about the science, and maybe this time someone would get it right. After all, remember that path little trick, that global warning? Repeat. After all, remember that path little trick, that global warming would drown the polar bears in 2006? So I went to my bed and seized with a loud achoo. And then I realized the governor had just given me some flu. Swine, that is. But you did, you did change the story a bit. Just a bit. And we could go with the classic. Are you going to read it again? No. No, you can read it. Need to do no, no, I'm not reading it. What I'm saying no, is you've, you're, you've got something to say, a classic, and you can change it All to right, a not so it. classic poem, okay. which captures, you know, right, another way that the Greg Wow, that was a classic poem with a slight change. Yes. Does catch the spirit of Christmas. Time. Yeah. Yes. It does kind of. In this odd time that we're in right now, I do think we do have a lot to give thanks for. And in addition to that, all of us in the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television broadcast area should remember what the true meaning of Christmas involves. Giving brother and sisterhood, sharing with family and friends whenever possible. And of course, at this time, social distancing. We should also be reaching out to all the members of the armed forces who serve far away and cannot be with their friends and family during this holiday season, plus all the first responders who work six, 365 days a year, even on Christmas. And we need to add our doctors and nurses and health responders who are working so hard to get us through this virus. And I think we all should get paid double or triple for all of the work that we do. That and sounds like a good thing to have happen. Yes. And of course, remember how this season should be of love, trust, and goodwill to all. And mm -hmm. thank you to the various companies that have come up with the virus vaccines and that are now being administered. And may we finally get this thing under control. Exactly. Remember, we have vaccines coming in the pipeline. And remember how this season should be love, trust, and goodwill to all. And especially the trust part. When Santa Claus comes around, remember, I'm not a burglar. <laughs> we at CLAW have a mission statement to help authors and artists become known to the public and to expose their artistic endeavors to the residents of Kitsap County and to the world. Thus, we plan to continue this endeavor as long as the BCAC staff and the viewing public support us. And we are anxiously awaiting to get back into the studio as soon as we have the virus under control. Claw exists for the artists, the writers, the authors, the painters, to help with marketing, distribution, and publicity. Once we beat this coronavirus from Wuhan, we will again rise like a phoenix and meet the first and third Wednesdays of every month at Sparrow's Pizza. Kitsap Way in Bremerton, Washington at 7 p.m. All are welcome. Also, for filmmakers and actors, we have a related group, Kitsap Peninsula Filmmakers, which meets the second Tuesday of every month at the Family Pay County House 
on Wheaton Way at 7 p.m. Everyone is welcome. Once again, once the restaurants are open again, we can work together again. But we are not the only group out here. There are many independent writers and critique groups in Western Washington. Hopefully, they will all open up. And then we will have the vaccine from Operation Warp Speed to help us. And CLAW and the Blue Forge Group are planning events in the future to support local authors, writers, musicians, and visual artists. And we will meet and beat the challenges of this evil COVID germs. We have all of our sessions coming up this next year, hopefully. We will find out. This program will be broadcast at the Christmas season in the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Broadcast Area. Check the BCAT schedule for upcoming shows. And we wish to thank the BCAT personnel, for without them, none of this would be possible. And of course, we thank you, the viewing audience, who we hope will continue viewing in this coming year. I also would like to say that you may notice that we are not in our studio at the BCAS uh, over on Tabardis. And that is because they are closed. So I wish to say a th big thank you to St. Anthony of Egypt Episcopal Church on Old Frontier Road in Silverdale and the vicar, Bill Fulton, uh, who has allowed for us to come here to the church to record our show today. And we did take cameras from the Bremen Kitsap Access Television Studio uh, remote cameras, and um, I wish to thank their staff for allowing us to do that. Yes, and as you can tell, we don't have a teleprompter. We don't, not, not this time. So. Ho, ho, ho! Oh, oh, oh. Merry oh, Christmas! Christmas! And, and remember and the milk and cookies. cookies! Yeah, because none of us really like the Twinkies and the uh, Ding Dongs. And anyway, have a good day, a delightful night, and remember this Happy New Year, and we'll put 2020, the perfect vision, behind us.